Hello, my name is Chris Lane. I'm a professor of history here at Tulane University. I've been here since 2011. I taught previously at the College of William and Mary in Virginia for 14 years, and before that at uh, the University of Miami in Florida for one year. I did my PhD at the University of Minnesota and my undergraduate degree at the University of Colorado Boulder. My most recent book is called Potosi, The Silver City That Changed the World, published by the University of California Press in 2019. And uh, this is my first foray into a, a book about a city specifically, although I've written about Quito, Ecuador, more, more about the region surrounding Quito than the city itself. And I've written about emeralds in Colombia. So most of my work has been it's focused on the Andes region of South America. Uh, it took me a while to get to Potosí as a scholar, but it was a place that interested me from the time when I was an undergraduate. It turns out Potosí was the world's most uh, concentrated and productive silver deposit or mining region uh, between its discovery in 1545 and, uh, and about the year 1650. It continued to produce silver after that, and it is still producing silver today. I visit Potosi when travel is possible about every year or every other year, and I've been going back there to work in the archives and also to talk to local folks many times. There's also a great deal of information about Potosi in archives in Spain and some in archives in the UK and the US and uh, France and Germany as well. Um, what brought me to write this book really was an interest in globalizing Latin American history. As you know, uh, the, the Stone Center for Latin American Studies here at Tulane is one of the largest in the country. That's the reason that I came to Tulane was to want to be a part of that large uh, and really incredibly diverse gathering of, of people working on Latin America from every possible disciplinary angle. Um, but also to, to globalize the story of Latin America in the early modern period, so the time of Columbus to about the time of Simon Bolivar uh, or thereabouts. We sometimes think of that as the colonial period or the early modern period. Either way, it's often assumed that Latin America was on the receiving end of globalization. It was not an agent of globalization. And although it produced products like silver in the case of Potosi or gold in the case of Colombia or emeralds or pearls, but these things were sugar in the case of Brazil, uh, that these things really didn't alter uh, Latin American societies in the way that uh, other places were altered by globalization. And I try to argue basically the opposite and to say that the situation of Potosi and the way that it changed the world was not simply by supplying a raw material, in this case, precious metals on a very large scale, an unforeseen scale, but, uh, but also Potosi was a place of transformation, social transformation and self-realization. It's, uh, it's kind of a a tricky story to tell as a global history because the city itself is fascinating in its own right and very well documented. The Spanish were very interested in silver production and, and so they kept pretty careful records here. And as much as they tried to control silver production, they really couldn't. It, it was always slipping out of their hands. So there are stories of indigenous mine workers doing their own thing. Certainly many of them suffering tremendously and being abused. It's not a, a pretty story. Uh, there are many enslaved Africans brought mostly from West Central Africa, from Congo and Angola, by a Buenos Aires, who end up in Potosi, and their story has not been told. I try to tell that, at least in a, in a nutshell, in this book. Uh, the stories of women who become very powerful in the city as owners of mines and refineries, but also as uh, religious women and uh, market uh, vendors. Um, so there's, there's really a space for everyone in this crazy boomtown, a kind of deadwood south, a very violent place. So a part of the story is, is to take on the myth and truth about the frontier violence of Potosi. It was a place where people challenged each other to duels pretty regularly. People were poisoning each other. Um, there's, there's lots of history of violence in this place. And I try not to, to over, overdo it, uh, but also to show that one of the curious things about mining towns, whether it's Potosi or 
could be Central City, Colorado, or uh, you know, somewhere in the Comstock load in Nevada, or, or even Deadwood, South Dakota. One of the curious things about mining towns is that in spite of their reputation for being out of control, uh, super violent, lawless even, uh, people figure out a way to, to enforce rules. And th even though they're fighting over mining claims and you know, access to merchandise and land and all sorts of other things, there's lots of social stratification and fighting. There's also uh, plenty of evidence of people cooperating. And so uh, what I see is a story of tension more than a story of exploitation and destruction. And all of that is, is the, the, the sob story, the sad story of Potosi has been told. And I, I didn't want to just add another chapter to that. I wanted to, to look for evidence of people making the most of a tough situation, uh, not to be overly optimistic about it, because clearly when you look at the environmental part of the story, which is another factor in the book, another feature that I'm trying to to bring up to date, because the, the history has become much richer, more uh, textured, uh, to show that environmentally Potosi is a disaster. There's nothing positive about it. it it's uh, Mining itself is poisoning the water, refining silver with mercury and and other types of solvents is uh, clearly adding all sorts of toxic substances to the water and the soil and the air. And people complain about it at the time. They talk about Potosi as a dangerous place, even, even in the 16th and 17th centuries. It's a place where you can't drink the water, where uh, food is very expensive, where uh, nasty smoke is spewing into the air. There's all sorts of sound pollution because of the, the mills in town crushing ore all night long, all day long. And, uh, and, and much more. Working in mines, of course, exposing workers to cave-ins, and, and the list goes on. So in some ways, it's also a kind of a, a harbinger of, of, a, of an industrial world to come. Horosi is industrial before industry was cool. And it's uh, a, a place where, as I said, in spite of all of the, the, the bad things that happen, all of the, the negatives that we associate with mining, and with the Spanish conquest and all of that, um, we also find extraordinary ingenuity. So another part of the story, and this is the last one I'll mention now, is technological savvy. The, the uh, usual image of the Spanish is that they were always behind the rest of Europe when it came to technology and science. And what we find in Potosí is that they're actually at the forefront. There are certainly certain people who are coming up with radically new ways of refining ore, and uh, developing a sense of chemistry that's pretty sophisticated in a time when alchemy was king. And uh, also the creation of some pretty alarmingly uh, large scale engineering projects, mostly to control the flow of water into the city to use for water powered crushing mills to, to, to refine silver ore into silver. And I guess the last thing I should say is there's uh, there's some stories in here about fraud, which is my current project. Um, how it is that the king's mint, the king's uh, money factory, is taken over by um, local, very savvy people, some of them officials and some of them private individuals. And it shows, again, the tension between government and private enterprise. And uh, neither comes out looking too good. But that's the story of Potosi the silver city that changed the world. Thank you.